Uh, I thought I'd start by asking and attempting to quickly answer a question, which is, what just happened? Um, what just happened over the past six, nine, I guess it's nine months by now. And I, I came, I've been thinking, I was thinking about it for a while this afternoon, and I came up with a, well, two-sentence answer. And it's first, financial markets around the world stopped working last fall. And this had a dramatic effect on the real economy, a bad effect. Um, I'm not saying there weren't tons of other factors at work. There was a very strange mortgage market that we developed in the U.S. with so much support for the concept of home ownership that sometime over the past decade or so evolved into basically government support for really lax lending standards. I'm not going to argue that the government response to the initial problems with financial markets that began almost exactly two years ago um, this week uh, weren't disjointed and inconsistent and in some cases probably made things worse. But you still can't deny, even if you think it's all the government's fault, that financial markets stopped working last fall. And I'm with the camp, and there's no way to prove this, but it, it seems like the more reasonable explanation that without the government in intervention we had last fall, however uh, clunky and unfair and, um, well, Goldman Sachs friendly, it was, <laughs> has left us substantially better off than we would have been if government hadn't stepped in last fall. So that's the basic starting point here. Financial markets failed. They seized up. They stopped working. They went kaput, whatever verb you want to use. And here's the interesting thing. The dominant academic theories for the past 50 years of how markets work and how economies work don't really leave any room for that possibility. There's really no theory in the textbooks that you get in finance classes in business school, or for the most part in economics textbooks, that explains why suddenly markets stop working, nobody wants to trade with each other, everything seems to be on the verge of breaking down. Now I will say there, there are lots of people, professors and PhD students who are studying these things and have their theories of it, but in terms of the dominant paradigm of thinking about financial markets that's evolved. That just doesn't happen. You don't have bubbles. You don't have crashes. They're not part of the discussion. Nobody has good explanations for them. So this is what I'm calling the myth of the rational market. This, and, and I got a very long email today from a finance professor at UC Berkeley, Mark Rubenstein, who made the excellent point at one point in the email that I never actually define in the book exactly what I mean by a rational market. Um, so I'm going to make a kind of an attempt here, and it, it's basically, it's, it's not any really formal definition. In, in the end, what that term is, is it was a book title that we picked that seemed to work. It was initially going to be, um, I, I think my agent and I, when we first sold the book, had this very non-committal title, Arguing the Markets, and that, that wouldn't have gone anywhere. And then my publisher came up with the myth of the rational investor, and then about two years ago, this project is something I've been working on for a while, I thought, no, it's the market we're talking about, not individual investors. So it, at one level, it's a marketing device. It's not a brand new theory of the world. But at the same time, I, I, I'm, pretty con I'm very convinced from the years I spent studying this and also just watching the reactions of regulators and, and lots of other people to the events of the past couple years that there was this widespread belief that financial markets basically got things right. They didn't need to be exactly right all the time, but they were right. They could be relied on, and they could behave in this calmly reasonable matter, manner most of the time. And so the question is, where did that idea come from? Because there have been an awful lot of episodes over history of markets not doing that, of, of breaking down. I mean, going back to the, the Dutch and their tulips many, many years ago, and, and, and it went on through the English and their South Sea financial bubble, the French and their Mississippi bubble. And then by the 1800s, these bubbles and crashes were happening almost every 10 years or so. One famous economist, William Stanley Jevons, even came up with this whole theory about how it had something to do with sunspots, <laughs> that that's what was causing financial crises. And then right around when he, he died in the, I think the 1870s, it suddenly, it was on this 11-year cycle with the sunspots, and then after that it went off the cycle and never quite came back. Um, 
so we've had these bubbles and crashes all this time. So why did we come up with this theory of how markets work that didn't have any room for them? And that's what a lot of my book is about. And what I was trying, what it is, I, I think, in a lot of ways, is that people people's ideas are products of their times. And in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, memories of the 1929 crash and the subsequent, well, and, and it just, the market kept crashing for several years after that, and the depression were starting to fade. And markets actually did behave pretty calmly in those days. And it just seemed, for certain purposes, and it is for certain purposes, perfectly valid to just assume that, okay, markets, markets can be thought of as these rationally function, functioning entities. Another really big reason why this came along, and the, the idea that markets work pretty well, not just financial markets, but all markets for products and services, everything else. I mean, that's been part of economics since the beginning, and it's a valid idea. Markets are brilliant at aggregating information and at making decisions quickly and at just figuring out what we should make more of and what we should make less of. But this new, at the same time, more careful but also more dogmatic version of this theory of markets grew up after World War II, and I think a lot of the reason was that during World War II, um, economics was changed in, into a much more mathematical and statistically oriented discipline, partly because economists were involved in the war effort in these remarkable ways using statistics to help beat the bad guys. And one of my favorite stories I learned in the course of this book is there was this organization called the Statistical Research Group at Columbia University, and it was this amazing uh, group of young statisticians and economists, including the father of one of our audience members here, um, and including Paul Wolfowitz's dad as well, and including Milton Friedman. And one of the questions that they, were, that they dealt with was with artillery shells, and I'm no gunnery expert, so if there are any here who want to correct me on the details here, but you score them to determine how many pieces they break up into. And it's a risk-reward thing. If you only score them into a few pieces, whatever, if, if you hit your target, you hit it with more, and you cause more damage. But if you score it into lots of little pieces, you cause less damage, but you're more likely to hit. And so these calculations of what's the optimal level of fracturing you want in your artillery shells were done uh, up at Columbia, and then Friedman would go down to Washington and uh, meet up with generals, no, not generals, lower officers than that, from the um, artillery officers from the Army who were in the midst of fighting the Battle of the Bulge. They'd come back to Washington to get advice from Milton Friedman on how to manage their ammunition. An experience like that can't help but make you more confident in your abilities and, and in what statistics and, and, and math can do for you. And I think there was just this dramatic development in the years immediately after the war where economics in the U.S. went from this still largely literary uh, pursuit where people would talk about what had happened in the past, it was very historical oriented, to something that was very much dominated by mathematical modeling and then when you were looking at the real world by a very statistical mindset. And so it was sort of natural that in the, in the 50s, chart reading in the stock market was very fashionable. It was sort of seen as the little guy's way to get in on making money on Wall Street, that basically if you knew how to read the charts, you could predict the future and, and, and make money without having any inside sources or spending lots of money doing research. And to some of these uh, finance professors and economists, they could immediately see that most of these chart patterns could just as easily have been generated by totally random processes. And so they, there became this whole little mini academic movement centered around MIT and the University of Chicago in the early 60s to sort of prove the random, you can't really prove it, but to explore the randomness of markets. And people would talk then about the, the random walk hypothesis and the idea that basically the future the best possible prediction of what the market's going to do in the future is just a, a totally random process. There is no secret to what it's going to do. And this is pretty sensible. It, it, it's not absolutely true, it turns out, but it, it's this pretty sensible idea.